We, we're going to start with the session with just looking back on the last couple of days. So the climate, uh, the Fair Share Summit started on Monday, on Monday night with an in-person event in Vancouver that was really beautiful and really soulful. We had a musical guest. We had speeches from two incredible keynote uh, speakers, Mina Rahman of the Third World Network and Jamie Neen of Mining Watch Canada. And I actually see that Jamie's in the meeting with us today. So thank you so much, Jamie, for being here and for uh, being in all the sessions and really providing so much rich input and so much of uh, your long history of struggle in Canadian movements. That's really, really valuable for all of us. Uh, so we heard speeches from Jamie and Mina and who got us grounded in why we're doing this this summit, why it's important to have a conversation about international climate justice and how our climate movement isn't complete without this internationalist lens. Uh, the, the next day, Tuesday, that was yesterday, we kicked off with a session on climate finance and this session was very popular. We had three incredible panelists who were quite different. We had Cece Holtz of the Climate Equity Reference Project, <clears throat> excuse me, we had Carola Mejia of Latindad, which is a Latin American uh, climate network. And we had Reginder Deal of SFU, um, and uh, who worked with us on the Fair Shares project over the summer. And that session was really fascinating. You know, we had CC talk us through uh, uh, Canada's fair share process, which is a process that they led us through for the first part, the first few months of this year, a few folks across Canada, including myself, got together in a working group and we crunched all the numbers for what Canada's fair share of climate finance would look like. And the number we got to was pretty astronomical. It was about $50 billion Canadian per year for the next decade. And that's a really big number to work with, but at least it tells us the shape of the beast. So, uh, and then we had Carola Mejia who spoke about the new, uh, the goal of COP29, which is coming up uh, next month or in a few days really, uh, where the goal is for all the countries in the world to come up with a new quantified finance goal. And this is important for so many reasons because without climate finance, we cannot have a global climate transition. We cannot win on climate without the big money. And so uh, the, this session was all about how do we unlock the big money. Uh, Rajinder Deal, uh, went through his analysis that he's been building over the summer of how Canada shows up in multilateral and international spaces. You know, we have a seat at the table in so many different international forums in the UN, at the IMF, at the World Bank, at the World Trade Organization, all of these institutions, Canada has a role. And when it comes to climate, how do we show up in those spaces? And Raj had a discourse analysis of the speeches that Canada and Canadian officials have made in all these international settings. And he talked about the equity principles of common but differentiated responsibility and historical responsibility. And he talked about how Canada has engaged or not actually engaged with those equity principles. That theme of the common but differentiated responsibilities, the CBDR as it's known, which is a foundational legal concept that actually became a thread that has run through the whole Fair Share Summit, which is really interesting for us um, as, a, as a takeaway from the summit. Uh, later that day after the climate finance session, we had, uh, oh, actually, before I do that, I want to share my screen because at the end of the, at the end of the uh, panel, we had a workshop, an interactive workshop. And so I'm gonna share some of the inputs from that workshop because it was really quite fascinating. And I wanna thank Shake Up the Establishment for um, building this slide for us. Oops. I don't know if you can see, can everybody see this slide? This was our, this was our workshop takeaway um, from the climate finance session. So folks really talked about things like uh, CBDR and uh, what Canada's actual responsibility is. Um, we sort of came to the conclusion that uh, one of the most important 
uh, aspects of climate finance for us to press on as Canadian movements is the uh, the necessity of grants based finance rather than conditional or loan based finance. And so Canada really tends to rely a lot upon loans to developing countries or um, conditional grants or um, private finance. And another sort of key theme from the summit has been the importance of public finance and of the state, the role of the state in, in mobilizing uh, climate finance. So that was that was really interesting, and it's something that we work with a lot at the Climate Emergency Unit. This idea of the role of the state um, being uh, the most important actor when it comes to mobilizing the political will to act on climate. So uh, after after that climate finance session, we had a trade justice and tax justice session. We had Hadrian Mertens Kirkwood of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, and we had D.T. Cochran, uh, who is a senior economist at the Canadian Labour Congress. And uh, we had that panel moderated by Bianca Mugenyi of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. And the, Hadrian presented on uh, the sort of tr international trade regime and how uh, fundamentally broken in many ways it is, how our trade regime promotes um, the unabated, uh, it hands unabated power to multinational corporations to be able to override so many important safeguards that national governments have put in place. Safeguards like environmental laws, climate laws, emissions laws, human rights laws, and these trade agreements uh, sort of allow um, the grieving, um, grievous sort of um, violations of of these basic foundational things like human rights and environmental corporations protected by very secret international courts um, and tribunals. And so we talked about the uh, these uh, instruments called investor state dispute mechanisms and those are embedded within trade agreements and uh, really have very little saving grace. They're just incre incredibly unjust and inequitable mechanisms that enable global trade to uh, block climate progress. Um, and then DT Cochran talked about taxes. Taxes as something that, you know, is so polarized and so political in our political discourse in Canada. We have politicians weaponizing the concept of taxation to stoke fear about government spending, to stoke fear about the use of taxes to fund things like climate action. And uh, DT Cochran was able to really break down the concept of taxation as something that holds a lot of potential for um, creating instruments that would redistribute wealth. Um, extreme wealth polarization and extreme wealth concentration also undermines climate action in so many ways. So we discussed instruments like a windfall profit tax that could help to redistribute some of the wealth that is being sort of drained um, and put into the pockets of, of major corporations um, and uh, as a way to restore some of that wealth into the public pocket to be able to um, take real climate action. Uh, all right, so that was, that was the trade and tax session and uh, thanks once again Shake Up the Establishment led a workshop that immediately followed the trade and tax session. And uh, it took us to this place where people were really grappling. The, the conversation got really good in that session. We were talking about, you know, a lot of people were very shocked and surprised by these investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, uh, these secret tribunals that allows that allow companies to sue governments. And... Um, we talked about what that would look like for civil society to have awareness and a sort of public opposition campaign to I to ISDS. Um, there's a there's a note here that we recognize ISDS as a modern tool of forced capitalism and a continuation of colonial control over global south economies. So it was really interesting to situate trade and tax as part as connected to a broader effort um, to build uh, climate justice around the world. The, 
it's a topic that's not often explored. And uh, we talked about what it would take to make taxes um, sound um, uh, to be placed in a popular framing. Like what would it what would it take to make those things sound appealing and um, understandable to the public? We've seen we've seen this weaponization of taxes in the wrong hands. We've seen the slogan "Ax the tax." A nice alliteration, or not alliteration, a nice rhyme. And what, what what would the other side of that look like? What could a popular campaign on taxation look and sound like? Um, so yeah, that was a really, uh, and we also talked about countering the conservative messaging on, on taxation, challenging the right-wing populism that is weaponizing these concepts. So yeah, that was, that was a really great session there. And then today we kicked off with our final um, content-based uh, session, which was on international financial institutions and debt. And this was actually probably the thorniest and largest topic. We took away a lot of learnings as the Climate Emergency Unit on, um, on what this session uh, should probably have been split up into, which was to probably split up those two massive topics into two different sessions because the conversation just ranged uh, so far and wide. But we did talk about climate debt traps. We talked about debt as a fundamental barrier to climate action. We talked about how debt, starting with um, colonial debt, post-colonial debt that was enforced on the developing world um, through these conditional loans that the IMF and the World Bank forced on developing economies. We talked about how that debt has compounded. And when you add climate impacts onto it in the form of you know, hurricanes or floods or fires or whatever the climate disaster might be, it just sets a match to um, an existing pile of tinder. And so debt traps keep developing countries from being able to actually take leadership and move forward on an energy transition. And it keeps them stuck in a fossil fuel economy, which is, um, we need to be actually removing all barriers to all economies being able to transition off fossil fuels right now. And debt remains one of the biggest barriers to that. So we talked about this idea of a debt jubilee, uh, the, debt, uh, the jubilee as a biblical concept that has existed for hundreds of years and in various forms, but what does a debt jubilee look like for uh, the debt of developing countries? It's essentially a massive debt forgiveness. Um, the jubilee is a concept that sort of, it happens every 25 years. And so we talked about what a jubilee campaign in Canada could look like for 2025. Um, we have had debt cancellation movements in Canada before. They've been largely faith led by mostly Christian churches. And um, those faith networks are still quite active in the debt uh, jubilee space. So it's an interesting way to connect. Um, it's it's a way to connect climate and and debt in this really uh, interesting uh, way. Uh, debt cancellation would free up so much climate finance and and so much political space for climate transition. So it's really hard to overstate the importance of it. And we talked about that in relation to this big financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, where Canada holds a seat and where Canada holds a lot of power um, and how these institutions uphold these unfair financial systems. Next year in 2025, Canada will um, assume there's a rotating chair of the G7 and next year, Canada will be the chair of the G7. And so we talked about that as a potential opportunity for, uh, for a campaign. <clears throat> or some kind of action. Uh, this was a really uh, big conversation. So our our workshop uh, was quite, was quite uh, far ranging, but one of the main takeaways uh, in addition to debt forgiveness, debt forgiveness is probably the biggest one, but uh, one of the main takeaways was once again, the need for grant-based funding over loans. So really once again, returning to this idea of the role of the public sector, uh, the role of public finance, and us as a climate movement really starting to have very clear red flags about uh, conditional finance, uh, loans, anything that is run through a major financial institution like a multilateral development bank, 
all of these things that Canada really relies on quite heavily. Uh, we as a climate movement need to be able to recognize those as, um, as smoke and mirrors and to return back to the absolute basics of uh, uh, public finance, of uh, the role of the state in taking climate leadership and, um, and the role of uh, just our governments choosing to act rather than choosing to, um, you know, sort of rely on these fancy public and private, uh, sorry, private uh, sector financial tools. So this, this is a very, this is a very challenging thing because debt and financial institutions are so huge. It's hard to imagine how we make a difference but it really does start with us being on the same page and understanding where the structural issues lie and where um, Canada could be showing up better. In, the, in that final conversation about financial architecture and debt, um, we, had, we, we just came to this conclusion that one of the things that's important for us to do as a climate movement is to, uh, Jamie put it as to stop Canada, which really is, you know, to be able to recognize when Canada is about to block some really important climate progress at the international level, or is about to side with the U.S. on something uh, on on one of these issues, and to be able to um, uh, have a concerted uh, sort of public opposition to Canada blocking progress in that way. One of the examples of the financials, global financial system blocking climate progress was brought up on the opening night and then it was brought up again in some of the sessions. And it was, you know, it's a very clear example of the government of Ecuador, who, you know, the Ecuadorian people, after a lot of organizing on the left, were able to elect um, an actual uh, anti fossil fuel uh, leader and Gustavo Petros. The leader made a statement about phasing out fossil fuels uh, and taking the country in that direction, which is absolutely what every government in the world should be doing right now. We should be announcing these massive, ambitious plans to phase out fossil fuels. And Ecuador, as a developing country, stuck their neck out to do that. But then immediately they were faced with the backlash of um, their credit rating being slashed and their currency being devalued, essentially punishment from the global financial system for doing the right thing. And I think there's a role for us to play as Canadian civil society and even being able to call that out and demonstrate awareness that we are opposed to the upholding of an unfair financial system. Okay, wow, that was a long uh, recap. There were so many good things that came out of the summit. I want to share one more thing before I pass it on to our uh, wonderful uh, partners at Shake Up the Establishment. We uh, shared a collaborative online space called a Padlet uh, at um, for the duration of the summit. And the Padlet was just a place where people could put their thoughts, their reflections, you know, further resources and things like that. So I just want to show our cute little Padlet and how people contributed to that. So there was some interesting discussion about the role of labor unions. So people put some thoughts in um, at each of these sessions, some really interesting articles and further explorations, this devastating meme about Canadian mining and uh, things like that. So there's lots of there's lots of stuff to look at if you want to check out the Padlet. Please free, feel free to use this Padlet beyond the summit as well. We'll be collecting um, inputs from all of y'all for uh, the next few days, for sure. So I want I wanted to have Shake Up the Establishment, some members of Shake Up the Establishment join us um, as a youth-led organization that's doing work in a number of areas across Canada. I really wanted there to be a youth-led perspective uh, in this conference, and Shake Up the Establishment has been so great with leading us through these interactive workshops. And so I wanted to pass the floor over to them to just hear their reflections on, you know, we've we've been a bunch of talking heads. Um, oh, I think pre oh, pretty much 300 of us over the course of the summit. And so I'd love to hear what folks at Shake Up the Establishment think of everything that's gone down. So I'd love to introduce Manvi, Megan, and Alia of Shake Up the Establishment. And I'm gonna put a link to their bios 
uh, in the chat. And I'm going to pass over the floor to you. Take it away. Thank you. I'll actually pass it over to Alia to kick us off. And um, each of us is just going to share some short reflections. And I'll just mention by name, um, Angelo on our team who couldn't be here today. He was also somebody who many of you might have interacted with as he helped facilitate some of the workshops yesterday. And he's very passionate about this topic. So um, I just wanted to mention he, alongside the three of us, um, were really the members of our, uh, of our national organization that were kind of involved more directly with this campaign. And so we're happy to share some some reflections with you today. So Alia, you can kick us off. Thank you. Um, I first want to say thank you to the speakers and organizers for putting together this event full of like knowledge and community building. And also thank you to the participants, all of you for sharing your knowledge and your feelings and your visions with us. I always love spaces where we can collaboratively reframe our understandings of climate justice and solidarity. My key takeaway from this summit is the need to prioritize collaboration over competition. We have to move past this mindset of competing in the perception of scarcity and we'll begin collaborating for abundance. So whether this is for energy transition, mitigation, adaptation funding, demilitarization, or debt elimination, these all come from a prioritization of collaboration across colonial borders and across different disciplines. The summit, uh, has asked us to build the way forward. And the way we can do that is reframing the narrative of Canada as a savior and into a responsibility owning collaborator, no longer perpetuating colonial attitudes. This can come from our own individual spheres and communities, but also through collaborative initiatives like these, where we can illustrate how local environmental degradation is often linked to global systems of extraction and exploitation and redefine our roles in international climate justice. So I'm really hoping that everyone can take what they've learned in this summit back. Okay. Um, uh, I really hope that everyone can take what they've learned in the summit back to the spaces they work, live, and learn in. Um, and one step at a time, we can collaboratively create the change that we all believe is possible. Thanks, Alia. I'll tap in Megan to share some thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you. Similarly, I also want to take a second to thank the speakers and organizers for putting together such an important summit on Canada's fair share, and also to thank the participants for actively engaging in dis the different discussions and tools that we had for you folks. It's always so interesting to hear from people with different perspectives and lived experiences, so that was really a highlight of the summit for me. Um, the Fair Shares campaign for me highlights that Canada has a certain amount of climate debt that needs to be paid to the global south, south for taking more than our, our fair share of atmospheric space and having such a long history of emissions. And it also urges us to do more than the global average to meet our fair share for historical responsibility. And now that the summit is over, I am in I'm being reminded that our current systems are not working for the majority of people. So we learned about international trade and investment agreements, the tax system and the global financial system, and how these systems among others do not work towards our collective liberation or climate justice at a global or even local and or local and national scale. Um, so what we're really fighting for here is systems change. I am also excited though, because the com th these conversations that we had the past few days are really just the beginning of what's to come. And I am cautiously optimistic that we will be able to transform or abolish these systems that hold us back and we can continue on the journey towards collective liberation. And as a youth, with that youth, youth perspective, I'm hoping that this can also be accomplished within my lifetime. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Manvi. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably keep it brief. And I just want to say, I really want to, uh, we keep saying it, but thank you so much for putting on this first of a time first of its kind. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's been a lot of talking today. Um, thank you so much to the organizer for putting on this like first of its kind um, summit and really bringing this topic into focus. I think a lot of young people in particular, racialized young people want to bring their whole kind of identities into the climate organizing space. So this topic offers us a way to honor and acknowledge not only like the responsibilities we have as settlers here with the emissions, you know, contributions and like the the global impacts of our actions here in Canada um, and 
in particular, the actions upon our motherlands. And I think this is a way for us to connect with those issues um, and like be able to show up as not just sort of environmentalists in the white environmentalist sense, but really environmentalists in a way that's really globally minded. And it's connected to um, ensuring that we're caretaking not only here and we're making action here, but that we're making sure that um, our motherlands are OK and that they're not continually going through cycles of, uh, you know, debt um, or debt forgiveness or you know all the all the terminology that was thrown our way um this summit and i think that um i just want to emphasize one of the pieces that we do in all of our work is we recognize that the climate crisis is rooted in colonialism and all the other isms and all the other systems and we hate them all um but so the exploitation of land and people um being directly connected to environmental devastation i think for us as young people we really want to solve all of these issues and the fair share summit and the topics brought up today really tie capital to all of these issues and help us find like really tangible solutions. I think sometimes we feel a little bit like, where do we start? Or, you know, how can we address a number of different issues with one solution and, and really addressing the evils of capitalism through our organizing work is definitely one way to hit a lot of different issues that we care about and that we, that which we don't want to see in our futures and in our lifetimes um, continue to create more and more problems um, if, within our society. So, I think it's a responsibility for young people to engage in fair shares and do so for our lifetime. Um, and like Megan said, I think we're very optimistic. Um, and so I'll just kind of end on the note that, um, that we're really energized by this campaign and really want to thank all the panelists. I think we're honestly still processing a lot of the stuff we've learned. So I'm sure that um, our engagement will continue in the long term with these topics and we'll be bringing these teachings into all of the other movement organizing spaces that we occupy. So we're excited to, to take them to the next step um, in those different environments with other young people as well. Um, yeah, thanks, Anjali, and I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you so much, Manvi, Megan, and Alia. That was um, really, really great reflections. Thanks for being here for the whole duration of this. Um, thank you, Manvi, for bringing up that really important piece that, you know, so much of these conversations rests on the fact that there is this deep global divide, and we are diasporic peoples, uh, you and I and many others of us in the climate movement, and so there is a deep connection to homelands where who are on the other side of this divide and who are facing the injustice of these massive systems. So part of dismantling these systems is to be able to name the shape of the beast and to get on the same page. This is just the start of a conversation. So um, actually, I'm just curious before I outline some next steps, I'm curious for those of you who are here, uh, who was able to attend uh, more than one session at the conference? If you could raise your hand or just like put a little thing in the chat if you were here for, for two or more sessions. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. I mean, I, there are definitely some folks I recognize here who were there for the entirety of the conference and I salute you. Uh, we do recognize it was a lot of Zoom. Wow, thanks Fiona, you were there for, and Nancy, wow, all of them. That's fascinating, yeah. Um, we, the, these topics are really huge and so it's really hard uh, to, to stimulate our imaginations to imagine what a robust Canadian movement on any of these topics could look like, but that's why we start here. We start in a very broad-based conversation and then we move into more um, focused uh, power mapping and identifying where the levers of power are. Um, I know our brains are tired. I hope our, our, I hope, uh, our hearts are inspired and enlightened by what some of these speakers uh, brought to the table. We had I have to say the thing that I'm most happy about from this conference was the most incredible lineup of speakers. We really had um, an incredible, an incredible lineup. So I want to just uh, say a few thank yous and outline a few next steps. I first want to thank our partners. There were several organizations that came together on the summit. Um, so the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is a national organization, the UBC Climate Justice Center. Um, the SFU Community Engaged Research Initiative, 
um, obviously us at the CEU and the Padma Center for Climate Justice, um, shake up the establishment, of course, and the BC Council for International Cooperation. We're all partners on this event, and we're very, very grateful um, that we were able to come together in that way. I really want to thank my team at the CEU. I want to thank Doug Hamilton, um, and I want to thank Aaron Blundeau for being such an incredible team to make to do this very heavy lift. Um, we will have uh, we will have a lot more flowing uh, from this initial conversation, but this initial conversation was a big lift. So thank you, Doug and Aaron, and the rest of my team at the CEU. I want to thank all of you for uh, for making the time. It's so hard when something's virtual and it's not in your immediate reality. So hard to show up and bring your whole heart and mind to the space. And I deeply, deeply appreciate those of you who did so. For next steps, we are going to take all of these inputs. We're going to take all the stuff from the workshops. We had these three amazing workshops. We have a ton of online inputs to now synthesize. We have the Padlet. We have the chat logs from all of these calls. We have the recordings of the calls. And um, we're going to take all of those and synthesize them and find some themes. I already identified some themes that were quite clear that came out of this, things like public finance and common but differentiated responsibility and debt cancellation. Those things were like very big, strong themes, but we'll do a little bit more analysis about this and we're gonna produce a bit of a, um, I don't wanna promise too much, but somewhat of a, a post summit report, something that you can all look at and see the, the outcomes from the summit. Or um, we're gonna post the sessions on our website. So for those of you who haven't been to the website yet, it's climatefairshare.ca. Uh, there's already a reading list on uh, the resources page of that website that has a lot of follow-up material. Uh, a lot of it is by some of the speakers at the summit. We have reports, we have articles, we have books, we have videos, tons of stuff that can help shore up folks' understanding of these issues. Um, and then we will be present, I will be present at the UN COP this year in Baku. I know a lot of folks who are at this, uh, who came to the summit will also be there. So there will be a little bit of a Canadian um, group uh, that will connect with each other. And I'll be taking the outcomes from this conference into my work at the COP. Please do follow along. Um, I'll be reporting, I'll be doing quite a bit of communicating out of the COP. I think the, it's only really justifiable to go to these things if you're going to properly communicate from them. So in the interest of that, if you have not already done so, please do join our newsletter, the Fair Shares newsletter. It's just uh, getting started. And Doug has just put the link in the chat there. Uh, we'll report out from COP using that. We will um, we, we look on our, our CEU channels as well for communications around that. And please do get in touch if you're also going to be there. And then after the COP um, and after uh, all of this synthesis is done, we're going to group some of the themes from the summit and come up with and talk to other folks in Canada who are doing this work. Climate Action Network Canada has been leading a lot of this work for a long time. Um, I'll touch base with them at COP as well. And trying, we will try after that to build um, a sort of uh, Canadian position, a unified Canadian position on some of these issues. That will be our Canadian civil society position that is as progressive and as radical as possible so that our government is put on notice that this is where we stand, this is our line in the sand, and this is the, the level of climate action that we will accept. Um, we have actually spoken about this work with some uh, members of parliament. They're very interested, they're very um, encouraging. We will, obviously we have a federal election coming up next year and um, uh, this is going to be a really interesting, uh, an interesting journey. So those are some of the next steps. Oh, sorry, I meant to say, so after, after we come up with this sort of like collective Canadian civil society position, we would love to host a number of smaller events. We were thinking things like power mapping and, um, and meetings with, um, with MPs around these issues. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to build on this work in the coming year. We'd love to stay in touch. 
And we're so, so grateful that, that you showed up, you brought your whole selves, that you, um, that you participated, you asked questions and um, that you stayed engaged with us through the whole process. So we thank you so much.